This last Monday, I was blessed to be able to spend ten and a half hours in the emergency room. Uh, the hospital was full. They didn't have a room for us, so we had to stay in emergency for ten and a half hours. And uh, One thing I love about modern technology is I had my whole lesson and, and my Bible on my cell phone, so uh, all was not lost. I was able to, to study. Karen wasn't in any mood to talk, so it was nice and quiet in there. Uh, I was a Methodist for the first 18 years of my life, and uh, as a young Methodist, of course, we studied the Wesley brothers a great deal, and it was there that I first heard one of my favorite stories about John Wesley, uh, who, in case you didn't know, was a great English preacher in the 1700s. Uh, one thing you may not have known about him is he was considered to be a rather natty dresser. He was a spiff, spiffily, is that a good word, spiffily dressed. <laughs> he was a sharp-dressed man. There you go. Uh, and one Sunday morning, he wore a bow tie that had long ribbons that hung downward. And after the sermon was over, a lady from the congregation walked up to him and said, Brother Wesley, are you open to some criticism? He said, I guess so. What would you like to criticize? She said, the ribbons on your tie are entirely too long, and they're inappropriate for a man of God. And with that statement, she took a pair of scissors out of her pocketbook and cut them off. <laughs> a hush fell over the people who were standing in line, and Wesley calmly asked, may I borrow your scissors for a moment? As she handed them to him, he said, ma'am, are you open to some criticism? She says, well, I suppose I am. He said, all right, then stick out your tongue. And if you don't know how that applies to today's lesson, you just haven't read it. Turn to James, the third chapter, if you would. James chapter 3. <clears throat> remember that I shared with you in the introduction to James, and it's important that you, you remember this throughout, that I, 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 probably it's not being very reverent about it, but I've heard it described as whack-a-mole theology. That is, just subjects pop up one after another, almost along the lines of Proverbs. So you kind of have to watch because James will, will change topics on you pretty quickly. Uh, it, it seems to happen in today's lesson, but one thing that's kind of interesting, although it looks like he's changing topics, he's not at all. He's just looking at the, the same issue from a different direction. So I'd, I'd like to start with one topic, though, that he's going he's gonna to introduce and then move to something else. But I don't want to give this short shrift. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I read that, that passage a lot. Uh, and whenever I talk to a person about being a teacher here at Crestview, I share that with them. I think that we ought to read this, take it to heart, read it again, take it to heart, uh, because I think we really need to understand what a calling it is to be a teacher. Um, as a matter of fact, Kay and I discussed this, when she, this very passage, when she uh, was asked to be the teaching director uh, for a community Bible study. Uh, it's a big responsibility, and it can be scary sometimes. Um, when I was a baby Christian uh, some 30-plus years ago, we were at a church up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, a friend was teaching our Bible study class. He was a good guy. Great personality, quick wit. But one thing that, I, that started bothering me as we were in there week after week after week is that I always left the Sunday school class thinking, now what did we talk about today? Because he could take up the whole time, very little of it actually on the Scripture. And then I realized after a while, although I hadn't taught before, that he was kind of making it up as he went along. There was no preparation. And people loved him because he was, like I said, a gregarious, quick-witted guy, very popular deacon in the church. But the lessons were about one quarter of an inch deep. And, and so finally I, I just was, I said, look, I'm a new Christian. I'm soaking this stuff up and there's nothing to soak. You know, I love you, but there's just nothing here. Uh, and so I decided to teach. And so the pastor had talked to me about teaching, and so that's when I started 
teaching the Bible. And when I teach teachers, when I gather our teachers, I'm responsible for ed adult education here. So when I gather them together and talk about teaching, one of the things I talk about is, here's what I expect from you. Three P's. Every person who, who deigns to teach the Bible ought to have three P's. Passion. You have to be passionate about it. You have to get up in the, on Sunday morning and say, I can't wait to get there. God's put a message on my heart. You have to have prayer. If you haven't prayed about your lesson, it's never going to get above the floor. And the third is preparation. Passion, prayer, and preparation. Uh, if you don't do that, don't teach. Just quit. And I tell my people here, I'd, I would much rather have an empty vacancy than a filled one. If you know what I'm talking about. And one thing that I hate is when I go to talk to someone about being a teacher, and have you ever heard this before? Well, I guess if you can't find anybody else, that's passion. That's passion. Well, if nobody else will do it, I'd rather have it empty than to have you there. And so God laid on my heart years ago that, that when you teach His Word, that you need to teach what it says. You need to teach what it means. But you don't leave that day without teaching what it means to me. Because the Bible was written with us in mind. It's the, it, that God reveals His character through His Word. And if I don't go a little way toward doing that, I'm not doing my job here. And so when it says that teacher, you shouldn't presume to be a teacher, it says we know who teach will be judged more strictly. Let me tell you how that happens. I, if I accept this job, I am responsible for conveying the truths of Scripture to you and hopefully helping to shine a little light on it. And if I'm not doing that, you need to get me out of here. Any teacher who's not doing that, you're wasting your time. You really are. And because God has placed you under their tutelage, that's a big responsibility for them, for me, for any pastor, for any teacher. And so you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged much more strictly than, 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 than another person who's here reading the Bible, who's, who's sitting out there. Oh, oh, believe me, you're going to have enough judgment on your own. Uh, but... That's why the Bible, in so many different places, regardless of the human author, Paul, Peter, uh, Luke, rails on and on and on about false teachers. False teachers are the scourge of a church because they influence, I don't want to say weak-minded, but shall I say uh, ignorant Christians. So be careful because you're going to be judged. I could go off onto another whole sermon, but let's leave that and go to the next. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Now, that's a segue from the first section of this, of this uh, chapter to the second. The first se section is be careful when you teach, be careful what you say. And then it says, okay, you're perfect, you know, if you're never at fault in what you say. What is that saying to us? There are going to be times where when I say it's just not right. When I make a mistake, and I have to be very careful about that, because if I were able to keep my, my, my mouth perfectly in check, then I would be able to also keep my whole body in check. In other words, if you can control your mouth, you could probably control everything else. And that, that's going to segue into the next part of the chapter, which I think is the most important. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Anybody here ever done any horseback riding? Uh, Lots of people don't even have to put bits in the horse's mouth, but still, uh, they've got the halter, but for complete control, that bit in the horse's mouth will make it turn left or right, uh, stop, get the commands because you've got it right there. Um, when, uh, when I work with our, our animals, uh, our bull named D.W., which, by the way, does not stand for Dan Wildridge, does not <laughs> Some people have asked me about that. He's named after Daryl Waltrip, the race car driver. Okay. Our bull named D.W. has got a mind of his own, but if I can get that clamp in his nose, he pretty well follows me because it's so uncomfortable for him. If I get it right up there in his face. So it's talking about the same thing with the bit in the horse's mouth. If you can get it in there, then you can turn the whole animal. A ship's another example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. 
miles. And here's another example of something very large that can be controlled by something very small. Uh, you've got that big old ship, and in the back, you've got a little rudder that just make it move. So he's giving you the example. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Let me stop right there. And I hope you see the word picture that he's painting, that sometimes seemingly small and innocuous things can have great consequences. Uh, a spark. Anybody ever, we spend a lot of time in the forest in New Mexico, and there's a forest fire going there. It's just incredible the destruction that it can wreak upon one whole part of the country. And many times it started by a spark, a, a spark from an all-terrain vehicle or, a, or a, an ember from a campfire can start a, can start a huge fire. So he wants you to see that small things can have large consequences. The tongue also is a fire. You think he's talking about the little three or four inch organ that's inside of your mouth? That, that's kind of a euphemism. He's, he's drawing a picture. Remember, he's not talking about the physical organ of the tongue itself, but what it says. What it says. What comes out of your mouth. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. Let me stop there for just a minute. If, if you remember in 1 Corinthians, uh, there's quite a discourse about the spiritual gifts. And in, when it talks about the spiritual gifts, it says, you know, the, the church is like a human body. We got eyes. We got feet. We, I, and I love uh, uh, in experiencing God. Uh, Claude King, who, when he was in Henry Blackaby, when they were writing, remember one chapter said, Iva Bates was a knee. And it said, if that is your legacy in the church, what part of the body was she? She was a knee. She was down on her knees praying. She was an incredible prayer warrior. So the, the body, the church, is made up of many different parts. Which is the most important part? Well, not only is there not particularly one, but the Bible says those parts that usually get the least honor, the least honor are the ones that are actually the most important. So the body is made up of many parts. Every person out there, all of you, have a function within the body. Let's talk about the tongue. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. So the tongue is the most dangerous part of the body. That's an interesting thing to think about. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by what? You got the picture? By hell. That's the evil of the tongue and how it can infect and affect the entire body. For good on occasion, but more often than not, uh, what is said can be the single most destructive force inside the body. And let's look at the church as a body. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man but no man can tame the tongue. If you didn't get the idea that he says the tongue can be a real evil, can be a real detriment, listen to this. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Don't you see the disconnect there? Um <clears throat> One of the reasons that I'm not on Facebook anymore uh, and haven't been for years is that early on in, in Facebook, we had a, a person who in the morning would do a little devotional praise to Jesus and all, all the things that really sounded pretty good, but sometimes in the evening uh, would post something really profane about her ex-husband. The same tongue cannot praise God and curse man. You can't, because who made man? God. So when you curse man, whom are you cursing? God. Let me tell you, fresh water can't come out of a salt mouth. It just can't. Um, years ago when I was in corporate America, when people were really unhappy, they asked for the bosses, the president's office, and and they would send those calls to me, and, and I had the most wonderful secretary, and uh, she just didn't, she was a wonderful Christian lady, and she just didn't put up with any profanity on the phone, and sometimes 
people thought they needed to, to throw in a little extra spice. And she had a phrase that I just love. I'd hear her listen and listen and listen. And then she'd say, sir, do you eat with that mouth? <laughs> Which I thought was really good. The, the evil, the vile, the vitriol uh, that can come out of a tongue is just almost unlimited. And, and look what the Bible says. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. All right. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I'm going to come back and talk about those scriptures a little bit more, but I hope that's got you thinking about the idea that, that I think is missing sometimes in church today. I don't, I don't hear enough sermons about this. Jordan preached a great one not long back about this, this topic. But we ought to, those who call on the name of Jesus, those of us who, who, who claim the mantle as Christians, ought to be very careful about what we say. Very careful. Uh, and I'm just not talking about just swearing either, although that ought to be one we check off the list pretty quickly. But it's because there, I've seen people who may pride themselves on the fact that they've never uttered a swear word, but will just gossip like crazy about someone else in the church. i got to tell you, the second is more destructive than the first. So we ought to be think, thinking very carefully about what we say when we say it. He's going to shift gears a little bit. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. Stop for just a moment. Have you ever put the words humility and wisdom together? The world doesn't. It doesn't. As a matter of fact, wisdom tends to puff people up, I think. But one of the things that I love about his description of wisdom is one of the hallmarks, one of the marks identifying wisdom is humility. Someone who's truly wise is going to be humble. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, in parentheses, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and besides that comes from whom? comes from Satan, comes from Satan, comes from the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So just like the words that are spoken, if your actions, if, you're, if by your actions, uh, by the way that you live your life every day shows, okay, uh, that you are being influenced for evil, then that's of the devil. Now, what, how can you tell what's in someone's heart? You, pretty much by the way they speak, because it, it, overflow from the heart comes, comes out of your mouth. Now, are, are there some people who talk a good talk but don't walk it? Can be. Can be. Uh, you know who takes care of that? God. He'll take care of that. But here's what he says. You can't... Say you're of God and act like the devil. You can't do that. Here's the problem. Sometimes we don't understand that what we do is of the devil. Sometimes, like the Pharisees, who were Jesus described as whitewashed tombs, we can even pride ourselves in things that we do that aren't of God and so must be of the devil. Look at the opposite. Look at the flip side, though. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. I don't want to get off that list too quickly. Because when he's talking about what is a mark of wisdom, what tells you if somebody's wise, look for this fruit, pure, pure motives, pure speech, pure thought. Pure actions. Peace-loving. Who's stirring up trouble? Is that wisdom? No. Considerate. Thinking about how your words and actions affect other people. Now, this next word is one that I love and 21st century America hates. Submissive. 
Let me give you a little clue. If something comes on network television, or just about any television, that is about religion, run the other way. Because most of those producers can't spell religion if you spotted them the R-E. They don't, they don't have any idea. And so there's a show now about submissive wives. And it's done pretty much to poke fun at women who say, I, am, I believe in the biblical idea of submission. A lot of the time, those women don't understand the biblical idea of submission. Their husbands don't understand the biblical idea of submission. And the producers darn sure don't understand the biblical idea of submission. Who's to be submissive? Everybody here. Doesn't it say husbands be submissive to your wives? It does. Wives be submissive to your husbands. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm the boss of you? Not what that means at all. Not what it means at all. And a person who has true wisdom is submissive. I find that fascinating because our, our culture says you're a doormat if you're submissive. What that says is that you yield to a higher authority. Some of you struggle with that just a little bit. I'm trying not to look your way. But the <laughs> Some of us are submissive. Full of mercy. Good fruit. You know what that is? Et cetera. When it says good fruit, we're talking about fruits of the Spirit. You can go down that list and it's not all inclusive. That just means you exhibit fruit of the Spirit in your life. Impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So he's talking about how can you tell if somebody's really wise? Just watch them for a while. I'll tell you, a, a, not a close friend, but a guy I, I, I know and I know pretty well that I think is one of the most remarkable men walking the streets of America today, and that's Jim Dennison. Uh, he's wise. And I see some incredible fruit coming from that guy, and he's a very humble man. Really, he's a very humble man, very uh, brilliant mind, influential type person, but you'd never know it if you met him on the street, if you're stopping to see him in the coffee shop, you know, because he is a, he is a, a, a submissive man. He's a peacemaker. He exhibits fruit in his life. Uh, does he sin? Absolutely. He'll tell you that. Uh, does he struggle with issues in his life? Yes, he does. But when you look at the fruit of someone's life, that ought to tell you about their wisdom. Um, when we went to a prayer breakfast, uh, Dr. Rabbi Zacharias, who to me is maybe the most brilliant person in America today, um, was talking about his dealings on a college campus, and he talked about a bunch of PhDs in a religion department at a prominent university, and he said they have been educated into imbecility. Uh, ooh, that's interesting. Our focus for the day is verse 6. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is in itself set on fire by hell. I am proud to say that we own the entire box set of DVDs of The Andy Griffith Show. I love the Andy Griffith show. Uh, they just don't make TV like that anymore. And as I'm doing the lesson today, Karen's kind of laughing at me because I'm scratching in the closet getting out the box DVD set because there's one episode I remembered and I wanted to watch for today's lesson. Here, here's what's fascinating. Almost to the day, it premiered on evening TV 50 years ago. Does that make you feel old or what? Andy Griffith, this was, this was March 22nd, 1965. And the, the episode was called Opie's Newspaper. Uh, Opie and a classmate started to produce their own news sheet, the Mayberry Sun. And uh, he was asking three cents a copy, and, and he sold one to his dad, and he said, well, if Barney buys one, that'll be two. It wasn't selling well. So Barney told Opie that he knows exactly what's wrong. He needs to broaden the scope of his stories beyond the classroom and publish news articles that people want to read. 
So he and his friend Howie decide they're going to publish all the gossip that's fit to print. And soon they're eavesdropping on conversations uh, around town, private conversations, and then they print verbatim what they heard with full attribution. So they come out with the first paper, and as Andy reads it, he knows that soon everyone in Mayberry will know exactly that a friend's casserole tasted like wallpaper paste, according to Aunt B. Andy thinks the Reverend Martin's sermons are dry as dust, and that Barney says Sue Grigsby got her blonde hair out of a bottle. When they realize what have happened, Andy, Barney, and Aunt B scour the town to try to retrieve all the copies of the newspaper that have been distributed. Can you retrieve gossip? Well, incredibly, they found most of the copies of the paper before they were read. But in one of the great scenes, uh, Andy goes up to the parsonage to talk to the Reverend Martin uh, Scared to death that the reverend has read his comment that his sermons are dry as dust. And uh, as he talks to him, he, he wants to ask him, has he seen the newspaper? And the reverend says, no, I, let me tell you, I wanted to ask you something first. I wondered if you could teach Sunday school for me. And Andy says, uh, well, I don't think so. I've done it before and didn't do too well. And the reverend says, no, I'm sure you do well. I'm, I, no way in the world would your lessons be dry as dust. So Andy knew he was busted, and the reverend laughed and says, you know what, now I've got you for an entire year of Sundays. <laughs> See, with social media, the problem has multiplied a hundredfold, and so is the damage. So has the damage. It damages individuals. I think all of us probably know someone that's had a real problem with social media. Because something that gets out of there is, is out there pretty much forever. It damages organizations. It damages work sites. It damages churches. About 20 years ago, we were at a church in the Mid-Cities area, and we had a new youth minister. And when I say new, I mean just right off the press. He was what, 24, 25 years old, um, wonderful musician, uh, and about that tall, um, and about that wide, too. Um, <laughs> great guy, loved singing with him in the choir, uh, and one Sunday, uh, I've told this story, we got back from prison, and the choir was full of the Holy Spirit, and we were singing, whatever you need, God is, just like that, including clapping of the hands, and one deacon got up and stormed out angrily. And he started a campaign uh, uh, working, calling individuals, trying to convince them that we needed to fire that mu new music minister because he was turning the choir charismatic. And he didn't talk to me, even though I was a deacon, because he knew I was in the choir. And so another friend came and said, did you hear what Cecil's doing? He's trying to get up support and talking bad about the music minister. And so I went and got the music minister and I said, hey, here's, you need to know what's going on. I'll go with you if you want to go see Cecil. So we went in. Now Cecil was 6'4", 240, and the choir, kind of choir director came up to about his belt buckle, I think. But I was proud of him. He walked right in and said, I, if you've got something to say, I think you need to say it to my face. And he had brought his Bible and showed him Matthew chapter 18. You got ought against me? You ought to come. That stopped that man from gossiping. Because he was condemned by what he saw. But it didn't stop the problem of the seeds that he had already sown. And that problem wrecked that church. Wrecked the church. From seeds that started with gossip. You've heard me say over the last few weeks about the damage that can be done uh, by gossip anywhere, but particularly in the church. Particularly, where sh if there's a place where people can, can agree to disagree, can handle their differences in a loving, redemptive way, where should that be? Here. 
Does it always work like that? Why? What's the source of that gossip? Satan. Satan. It's of the devil. He doesn't need a frontal attack. He can do a a sneak attack. And he does it sometimes through, dare I say, well-meaning people who would rather talk behind somebody's back. What can we do? I want to tell you, this is one that I struggle with. I don't consider myself a gossip, but I think anybody who ever talks about someone else needs to stop and consider what they say. And so what I've tried to do is that any time during the conversation someone else comes up, I do a little pre-flight check and say, okay, what am I about to say? Is it redemptive? Uh, Several years ago, I was reading in a magazine uh, uh, an article written by Joel Gregory. I don't know if you know Joel Gregory. He at one time was a pastor of First Baptist Dallas, uh, was one of the best-known voices in America and church. Uh, And he called Paige Patterson, president of Southwestern Theological Seminary, a theological Lilliputian. Uh, That's not a compliment, by the way. Uh, And so I fired off a letter to Dr. Gregory, and I said, I got to tell you, man, I don't know what you hope to accomplish by calling another, uh, a co-laborer in the Lord's uh, workforce here, a theological Lilliputian, but that, how was the cause of Christ advanced by your doing that? He wrote me back a rather self-serving letter comparing himself to the prophet Nathan, uh, which was a real stretch, I thought, uh, given the tone of his his comments, uh, but there was no repentance there. And I think that started a fight, an enmity between the two that I don't think is healed yet. Now, how is the cause of Christ served by two of the uh, preeminent voices in Texas Baptist life sniping at each other? Who who gains with that? Only Satan. So what I would hope we would do is whether it's in social media, uh, whether it's in a conversation, um, and, and not just... Friends getting together, whispering to one another, even if it's in a public forum, that before we say words about any other person, we stop and say, all right, how does this glorify Christ and what I'm about to say? I, there's, nothing, there's nothing unscriptural, unbiblical, or satanic about talking about another person. Uh, prayers, for example, or talking about another person. Prayers can get to be gossip. Prayer requests can get to be gossip sometimes. But stop and think about that. Well, I wish you could see your faces right now. We've all, we all do it. We all do it. And, and here's something that might help. Talk to the hand. If someone, else, if someone is, is telling you just some little juicy tidbit about somebody else, talk to the hand. You know what? I'd just rather not hear it. I'm preaching to myself. If it happens to splash up on you, okay. But what I want you to think of today is what James' reminder is about the tongue. Be careful. If you can control that, you can control all the other things about your body because that's the most dangerous one. And take it to heart. How do we apply it to our own lives today? Can't miss this one. Think about what we say and say, does it glorify God? Has anyone else ever had that happen? That she says, sometimes uh, just a thought, well, I thought it was just me. <laughs> and, and sometimes just thoughts pop into your head and you say, oh, Lord, where did that come from? Well, Satan could have, could have put it there, certainly. Uh, we're still sinful at, at our very core. But, you know, what's bad is if you can at least stop that, get, get your head back right and say, Lord, I'm sorry that that crossed my mind. What I love is what Paul said. You know what? I do what I don't want to do. I don't do what I want to do. Uh, One of the great greats of the faith can say that. But what's really bad, you can't control if it comes out of your mouth, though. 
you, you can stop it right there. I joke sometimes about some of my friends not having very good filters, you know, between here and here. Uh, but you have a filter, and you can stop it there. So please, let that be a matter of prayer for us, that what we say be redemptive, that, that the cause of Christ be advanced, be glorified uh, by what we say and not destroyed. Next week, we're going to talk about submission. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Father, I am so, so sorry about the things that I say because so many times I don't want to say them. Uh, I don't think enough, Father, and I want to pray that you'd forgive me when I let you down by my speech. Father, I want to pray that you would help me keep my thoughts pure and on you. Father, I just want to pray for this class. Thank you for them, those who come to share your, share your message, to study your word, and I want to pray that that like the fire that the tongue is, that the Holy Spirit lights up their lives, Father, to combat the fire of the devil. Father, I want to pray for our pastor, ask that you give him strength and wisdom, that you be with our teachers, uh, that your Holy Spirit move in their lives and through their lessons, for I ask it in the precious name of your Son. Amen.